get things started this morning. Anybody got a question or anything that they want to toss out here to get things cranked up on? You know, we only got, uh, you know, next Lord's Day is uh, still this time. The following Lord's Day, you lose an hour of sleep. So I'm just trying to get you mentally, you know, geared up. I don't have as much trouble, you know, in the fall on the switch, but boy, that spring switch sometimes is, is a tough deal. So, so. Mr. Andrew. So this last week I had a conversation with a coworker about the Holy Spirit, and his question was specifically, uh, he was worried about losing oneself if you were to become like Christ, and that was kind of his question, and I was explaining how the Holy Spirit helps you become your true self, and you're not losing yourself, you're just becoming a reflection of Christ, and I was curious if I could get your take on how you would explain that to someone. Yeah, that, that's actually a really great question, and it's actually pretty deep. Um, at a, at a very core level. Um, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, is, Jesus is telling a series of parables here about how, um, you know, the, the value of everybody, you know, um, Gunner did a good job in the opening pointing out that, you know, God's willing to forgive, you know, anybody in the human race if, if they'll, they'll turn toward him, okay? And people do have a tendency to, you know, kind of segregate themselves into classes. You know, the <coughs> a favorite example of mine is I was talking with a guy by the name of Vilnius Brazinus, and uh, Vil Vilnius was from Lithuania. And... Uh, you know, and they're different than the Latvians and the Estonians and the Russians and the Poles. The fact is the, the language of Lithuania is the modern language that's the most closely related to ancient Hindu. Okay, which you would never suspect things like that, but that's how it is. And so I was talking about how he was related to the Russians. And he was very emphatic. No, he said, they're Slavs. They're Slavs. Okay, Lithuanians are not Slavs. See? And uh, another time I was uh, in England, uh, in London, and I was talking to this lady and I asked her if she was British. And she was very emphatic. She was English. Because if you go back into history, which, uh, you know, you wouldn't be particularly aware of, <coughs> the, uh, the Bretons were there first, okay? That they were a Celtic people. And uh, they were some somewhat, so to speak, converted to Christianity, and then the Anglo-Saxons came from Germany, and they were pagans, and so they pushed the Bretons <coughs> off to the west and to the north, okay? And so there's quite a dis difference between the English and the British, okay? And uh, she was English, and she wanted me to know that she was English, and she was not British, okay? So, <laughs> human race. So, in... Uh, you know, Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells uh, one of these famous parables here. In verse 4, he says, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 per righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, the operative word here for, for our discussion this morning is one, okay? The value of the one sheep, you know, leave the 99 for the one, okay? Now, the scripture, you know, starts at this very basic point here, explaining the value of the one, the value of the individual, okay? And, uh, <coughs> you know, the... If you go to Zechariah chapter 12, <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 12 and, and verse 1, this is uh, <clears throat> the burden, yeah, that's for Charlie this morning, we're just throwing that out there, uh, <clears throat> the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. See, it's pretty clear that each individual is very specially formed, you know, that that spirit is formed at conception, and that, 
that individual is an individual, period, okay? And so God communicates in a lot of different ways the value of the individual. So, you know, it brings up a, an interesting question. See, if we turn to John chapter 14... You know, one of the things that Jesus is talking about is uh, in, in verse, uh, oh, picking it up, verse 10, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe in the works themselves. Okay, so... The point here is that, you know, Jesus and the Father are in identity, okay? And if you back up to John chapter 10, now Jesus is talking about the, uh, the disciples, the sheep that follow him. He says, verse 27, John 10, 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, Okay? My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand, out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, here he's making the point that the sheep follow him. John 17, what about those who do follow him? In uh, verse 22, he says, The glory which you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, <clears throat> though that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as, you father, as, even as the Father loved me. See, that's the same language as, you know, the Father and the Son being an identity. And that as, as the Father and Son are one, the picture is that we are one. Okay? So, okay, so if... We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit then. See, the concern is, is losing our identity. Right? And uh, so the, I like to bring Hinduism in here because Hinduism is a, is a great illustration of the opposite of uh, what God does. In uh, Hinduism, you go through the endless wheel of samsara. Okay, that's your continuing reincarnation cycle, okay? And uh, when you get rid of enough bad karma, you know, bad karma is what you bring over from a previous life, okay? Again, people use terms without knowing what they're talking about. But uh, karma is what you bring on. Your karma is your paying for the sins of a previous life in this one. See, and that's the only way you get there. And so you go through enough reincarnation cycles, uh, you eventually uh, attain the highest end, which is nirvana. In nirvana, you lose your la yourself in the last vast nothingness of the cosmos. Most, okay? Um, I was mentioning, we had a similar question in Great Falls. I was mentioning that, you know, when the Star Wars series came out, um, I actually bought the book, The Return of the Jedi. I never did, I never have seen any of the Star Wars. Um, you know, I was kind of concerned because the big saying at the time is the force be with you. And, uh, you know, I can get, you know, I can read a book a lot quicker than I can read, a, you know, watch a movie. So um, I grabbed the Return of the Jedi. Well, <coughs> Yoda, you know, obviously a good character, um, when he dies, his life force becomes part of the force, doesn't it? And when Darth Vader dies, his life force becomes part of the force. And the force has both a light and a dark side. That is absolute pure Hinduism. Absolute pure Hinduism. And uh, so, you see, Yoda, his life force became part of the force. Darth Vader, his life force became... See, they lost their identity. In Hinduism, you lose your identity. Okay? Now, God's going to a lot of work, see, to show us that we never lose our identity. If you turn to uh, Revelation uh, chapter 2, the message to Pergamum, 
Revelation 2.17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows, but he who receives it. See, the point is, is that individual's identity is preserved throughout all eternity. Now, personally, I'm convinced that one of the reasons that God communicates himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is to show that even when we're one with him and he's one with us, in, in one manner of speaking, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit never lose their identity. In the same way, in all eternity, we never lose our identity even though through the Holy Spirit we become one with God, God's become one with us. That identity is preserved. The devil, of course, is attacking identity, person's identity. That's, that's the major attack. Um, one of the key aspects of evolution is that uh, you're just an accident. You know, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, what makes mankind think they're so special anyway? Right? I mean, we're just a genus and species, so, you know, what makes us think we're so special? You know, what, what, makes, what makes man different than turtles? See, you, you can see where that goes. And so, if you're the last accident on a long chain of accidents, then how important are you? See, accidents are random, aren't they? Okay? See, where the scripture, you know, like goes to a, a large, you know, great extent to say, no, you're specially created. Um, you know, I hold you in the palm of my hand, you know, you're the, the apple of my eye. Um, you know, you, everyone who gives even to one of these little ones a cup of cold water to drink in the name of a disciple, he said, he's not going to lose his reward. See, God preserves the identity of the individual and the value of the individual. Satan does everything he can to attack the value of the individual through all the false religions and false philosophies. That lets you know that that is a very key and important issue, and the question is a, is a deep and important one. Do we lose our identity? The answer is no. See, the Holy Spirit you know, works with us. And if you go to Romans chapter 8, it's a very interesting piece of phraseology here. Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 16. Romans 8, 16. He says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. See, notice that the Holy Spirit <clears throat> doesn't just wipe our spirit out. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit, with, alongside. See, the parakletos, one called alongside to help. And so, so the Holy, so our our will is never, our our will is never obliterated. See, our our will is always the operative factor, which is another means by which God preserves our identity. So, is that enough, Andrew? Or further further comments on that? Okay. Other questions this morning. See, again, some of those things are hugely foundational. Nick, I was actually going to comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. Question, but in verse 15 says that uh, we have not received a spirit of slave slavery leading to fear again. That's pretty, to me, that's a significant statement yeah. of what the spirit does in conjunction with who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's a great point. Not a bunch of slaves. No. Not operating on fear, operating on initiative. Yeah, great point. Which you have to be an individual to operate on initiative. Good. So even as we are conformed individually to the character of Christ, we're not going to be clones. Yeah. There's still going to be your, and we're not talking about sin issues, we're not talking about character stuff, like our characters, be, but there's still strengths, there's still personality strengths, etc. Yeah. There's an individual identity, and it, it does seem, I mean, personally, one of the things that motivates me is it's, there's also scriptures that talk about, in he, you know, you get the idea even, I mean, Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain of transfiguration. They're still recognized as Moses and Elijah. And if there is no identity, 
it shuts down a lot of my motivation to seek and save the lost personally. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, again, Nirvana, the highest end you can achieve is to lose yourself in the vast nothingness of the cosmos. I mean, I've got Mitchell motivated already. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> but see, good question. Other questions this morning? Okay, well, we'll go with the slideshow then. I asked Bob to go back and, you know, put up uh, this one here because a question came up on the 53 books, okay? And so I went back to, you know, make sure that I knew what I was talking about on that one. And uh, so it says the 53 books of this translation. And, uh, okay, so there's uh, 39 books of the Old Testament, right? 14 books of the Apocrypha. So 39 plus 14, Elise is calculating over there, you know, happens to be 53, doesn't it? Okay, so this particular LXX has the Apocrypha with it. That's why the 53 books, okay? So I wanted to, you know, make sure that that was clarified. Uh, again, the Apocrypha were, I mean, they were there, they were around. Uh, Again, the, they put the date 100 B.C. on the LXX. You know, everything that I've seen is 250 to 200 B.C. And it seems to be that some of the later Greek scholars added the Apocrypha to the LXX, okay? Um, but, again, the Hebrew, okay, it's pretty clear that the synagogues of, of Jesus' day only used the 39 books of the Old Testament. They didn't use the Apocrypha. And uh, the Apocrypha ended up being incorporated, you know, in uh, a lot of the early publications. You know, the King James Version originally incorporated the Apocrypha. Um, I was looking at my facsimile of the Geneva Bible yesterday. It, inc it incorporates the Apocrypha. But, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the Protestant scholars recognized pretty quickly, nah, 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 you know. And again, like I say, all you got to do is pick up the book of Judith and the Apocrypha or Bell and the Dragon or Susanna and read through that. And you're saying, well, it doesn't sound like Zechariah. <laughs> and uh, so further questions on, on that. Yes, the Catholic Bibles always do. Yeah, that, and that's a great point. Uh, maybe comment on a little bit later. But see, anyhow, is the... See, is the pro okay, the development of the printing press, which is going to be featured here shortly, which will be kind of review for us. Um, development of the printing press, of course, broke the yoke of Catholicism. See, because now people are going to be able to have a, a, a copy of the New Testament in their own language. Okay, when they start reading, you know, the New Testament in their own language, they don't like to stay Catholics any longer, Okay. So that's why the Catholic Church did everything it could to stem the tide, uh, you know, of uh, recalcitrant and, and uh, rebellious groups, okay? Uh, but they, you know, they couldn't. So their solution, see, in, in 1546, okay, so we're, you know, um, Erasmus is what, I think 1514 on the, or 1517, on, no, 1514, on the, his translation, okay? Luther's translating the Bible into German in 1522. Tyndale's translating the Bible into English, 1526. 1546, <coughs> see, the Catholics hold a big council. And at that particular council in 1546, that's when the Apocrypha officially became a part of the Catholic Bible and not until. And you can see it's kind of reaction against the fact that the Protestants are in the process of throwing it out of there. Okay. Other question on that? I think. Uh, with the, the history of the books and things and the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything, um, is there um, any mention or any knowledge of when the Roman army came into the city to? Uh, destroy uh, the area around Qumran. Was is there any mention of that anywhere in the Bible or any anything like that? Well, the 
The Old Testament actually predicts the destruction of Jerusalem and the land of Israel. And, of course, Jesus does. Now, the only actual mention that the New Testament has is in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 8. See, it's like from the New Testament perspective, no big deal. You know, I mean, the Jews have been set aside, and so the New Testament isn't going to make a big deal of that. And, by the way, the, you know, the Romans did get to Qumran, and that's why they actually buried a lot of those scrolls and stuff in those caves were to protect them. And, uh, you know, it was, again, the hand of God that preserved, say, the Isaiah scroll for our benefit. But Hebrews chapter 8 and uh, verse 13 It says, uh, when he said a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. See, that temple is going to come down. You know, the priesthood is going to be gone. The sacrifice is going to be gone. Record's going to be gone. Everything's going to be gone. That's only reference, direct reference to that in the New Testament writings. Everything else is a prophetic statement. And even this is, to some degree. So the New Testament, you know, it's not a big deal because you know, cast out the bondwoman and her son. You know, the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. You know, the new covenant people, they recognize that, that they've already moved on. So they're not going to be, you know, laying their harps in the willows and, and not singing some songs because of the fact that uh, the temple is in ruins. Okay, the new covenant people aren't because the new... Let, let's go to Jeremiah 3. That, that just reminds me of something else I wanted to throw in here. You know, I mean, the, the destruction of the ha temple happened re really twice. And uh, the first time it was destroyed was uh, 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. And it's, it's interesting, you know, the temple uh, was destroyed on August 10th on 486 B.C. I mean, excuse me, 586 B.C. The temple was destroyed August 10th, 70 A.D. You only got one out of 365 chances of that happening, okay? Pretty interesting. But uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse 12, he says, Go and proclaim these words to the north, okay? And the reason that Jeremiah was to proclaim these words to the north, just want to kind of review this, when people like the Assyrians came in, you know, they had to go around the Arabian Desert, and then they'd come down <coughs> the the chain here uh, to the west of the of the Jordan River. Okay, so they're always pictured as coming in from the north, and then when they leave, they leave going to the north. Okay, so the physical nation Israel was carried away captive to the north by the Assyrians. Okay. So Jeremiah is supposed to go and, okay, get my directions straight. You know, he's supposed to <coughs> proclaim, you know, he's supposed to pro proclaim to the north, see, because that's the direction they left. And that then, in a manner speaking, is the direction from which they're going to return. Okay. It says, go proclaim these words to the north and say, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. Now, Israel of Jeremiah is the prophecy of the Gentiles coming back. Okay? The, uh, <clears throat> so, prophetic Judah is the core, Jewish core that formed the basis for the, or the, the core group for the Christians, for the church. <clears throat> and prophetic Israel is a reference to the Gentiles that are coming in. Okay? It says, all acknowledge your iniquity, that you've transgressed against the Lord your God, scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree. In other words, they became idolaters. You've not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. <clears throat> Return, all faithless sons, declares the Lord, for I'm a master to you. Now, here's your, your key words that let you know it's the Gentiles coming in. For I, I'm a master to you. I'll take you one from a city and two from a family and bring you to Zion. Prophetic Zion's the church. You know, Hebrews 12, through 24 makes that really clear. It says, then I will give you shepherds after my own heart. I will feed you on knowledge and understanding. You see, that's the purpose of the church is to 
knowledge and, and understanding, you know, to, to feed the, 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 the brethren. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable to you. Okay, he didn't, he didn't back off just because it was controversial or, you know, <clears throat> maybe some people didn't like it, you know. Um, he says, it shall be in those days when you're multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord, they'll no longer say, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it, nor will it be made again. Okay, particularly the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you know, which is, was the core. Of course, that was gone in 586 B.C. It was definitely you know, not there after 70 A.D., right? Okay, so uh, this morning when we have the Lord's Supper, are you, and you guys, you know, pining over the fact that the Ark of the Covenant isn't in the, in the tent of meeting someplace? I mean... You know, if I hadn't brought it up this morning, you wouldn't have thought about it. <laughs> Which is exactly what Jeremiah said. So it won't come to mind. Don't think about it. Why? Because the new covenant. See, the new covenant's in effect. When that temple came down, A.D. 70, any of the trappings were gone. You know, it says at that time, verse 17, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations, see, all the Gentiles, then look around, you know, will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord. Guess whose name you're immersed into? Okay. No, nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of the evil heart. See, I mean, the very first words out of Peter's mouth when they were asked what to do is repent. Okay. <clears throat> repent means you're not going to walk after the other, uh, evil, stubbornness of your evil heart anymore, right? Okay. <clears throat> and uh, in those days, the house of Judah, see, We'll walk with the house of Israel. That's the, you know, for Ephesians chapter 2, he says he's going to take the two, you know, and bring them into one new man. You know, he's going to break down the, the middle wall, you know, that, that separated them. And they will come together in, from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance, which is a spiritual land, see. So the point here, once again, is that the physical uh, didn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. And so that's why the New Testament isn't going to talk about that particular. Cover that? Okay. Mike, did you have the following here? So in Psalm 48, in verse 2, when it talks about Mount Zion being on the sides of the north, is that? Okay. And it's, so is it talking about with Jeremiah there? I mean, does that go together? Yeah. Okay. All goes together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, most of the stuff in the Psalms is is kind of prophetic, you know. My buddy Ken Weibert, you know, when Ken is a really good photographer. And uh, so he had a picture of a stream coming down from the mountain. And the upper part of it is kind of hidden in fog, you know, and the stream is coming down. He made me a picture. I think maybe it's still hanging in the office here. And it said, uh, th there's a city whose streams make glad. You know, there's a street, this river whose streams make glad the city of God. You know, prophecy of the Holy Spirit in the church. So, all the way through the book of Psalms, just loaded with those prophecies. Charlie? Well, I just never had heard of the Ag Agbatha uh, Bible, I guess. Well, uh, Apocrypha, yeah. Uh, okay, so it was, it was written by the ca Catholics? No, no, it was written by early people, co you know, connect with Jews. You know, there's always a bunch of Jewish, anywhere it's a bunch of visionaries, you know, who claim that they got inside information that nobody else got. Okay. And but that's what the Senate was, yeah. And so it's just been dropped out because it wasn't yeah. from God. Yeah, it was pretty clearly not. Okay. <coughs> yeah. All right. You know, back earlier, I th I think I heard you say that, that, that the Greeks translated or put together the Septuagint? The Greek Jews. The Greek Jews, okay. Cause my question was going to be, what would the Greeks have any motivation to do that? But okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was the Greek speaking Jews in Alexandria. Yeah, good. Well, then it brings up another question. Then, why do these Jews introduce these other books, the, the Apocrypha? Yeah, and that's a great point. See, and again, you always got these Jewish visionaries. Let's go to Acts 13, okay? So we get to come with Paul and Barnabas 
to the west side of the island of Cyprus on the first missionary journey. And uh, verse 6, Acts 13, 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, which is on the west side of the, the island, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, <laughs> whose name is Bar-Jesus, uh, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for so his name was translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So you got this Jewish magician, right? And he's Jewish, but he's a magician, right? That, that ain't going to fit, is it? Yeah, okay. And then Acts uh, 19. Just picking a couple examples here. Okay, so Paul's been able to do lots of miracles there in Ephesus, and uh, evil spirits are being cast out. And so verse 13, <coughs> Acts 19, verse 13, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now seven sons of one Siva, a Jewish chief priest, we're doing this, okay? And, of course, the story is that the evil spirit says, I know about Jesus and I heard about Paul, but who are you? Okay? And, you know, stripped him naked and threw him into the street. But it's interesting. So we got Siva here in Ephesus, who's a Jewish chief priest. That's a long ways from Jerusalem, right? Obviously a lot of promo going on. And, and you got these guys being exorcists, you know, casting out demons, right? See, my point is, is that inside the Jewish system, you had a lot of mysticism. You had, as you'd expect, you got con artists, <clears throat> every age, every class of society, inside every religion. You got these con artists working. These are good examples. So it's not surprising if you go back to Alexander, Egypt, that you got similar type con artists that are claiming to have special information and writing these bogus books. Yeah. But then um, it's interesting that, to, to me anyway, that you know, Jesus obviously never quoted it, any of the Apocrypha, but did he make any, even, even any allusions or, or cast any dispersions upon the Septuagint in any way? Well, he didn't ever. He never cast any aspersions on the on, on the LXX, but but there, but there are some there are whatever whatever it was, uh, fourteen or so bo books books that are not should not be there. But did any other Jewish leaders ever speak up against it? Well, obviously they didn't include it in the synagogues. See, why is that? I, I didn't catch that. Why is it obvious they didn't? Well, the records show that the that the uh, LXX that the synagogues used did not contain the Apocrypha. Yeah, the Jews rejected that pretty clearly in, in, as, as bogus stuff. And, and that's why, you know, uh, you know, again, the Apocrypha is included in a lot of the early translations. Okay, but when the information came to light that the first century Jews or late, you know, first century B.C. Jews didn't use the Apocrypha, that's when they dropped it. So I know you had said earlier, everything you've seen with Septuagint is 250, 200 BC, which I agree with. But the, the apocryphal part that would have been added too, that's probably why this goes to 100 BC, because yeah. some of the stuff, even like the history and the Maccabees and stuff didn't happen until what, 165 yeah. BC or something. So it's, that's probably why they put that wide range on there, is later that apocryphal stuff was added to the Septuagint. Yeah. And you gotta remember, this is a, Excuse me. This is a Rose Publishing um, presentation here, and um, you know Rose has got quite a few Catholics that, you know, Episcopals that purchase in their stuff. See, so again, it's always good to follow the money trail when you're when you're paying attention. See, so they're actually they're they're not wanting to be hostile to the Apocrypha in this Rose Publishing presentation here. sure you probably would get to this, but <clears throat> I'm curious now with these 14 books of the Apocrypha, 
where did they fit in the four categories that are on your slide? Were they prophecy? Were they poetry? What were they? Well, they're, they're primarily, I guess, stuck in at the end of the Old Testament. You know, I was looking at my LXX yesterday, which has the, the 14, and they're all at the end. So that would be in the, uh, uh, probably, would <coughs> some of it, like wisdom is poetry. You know, there's a book called Wisdom. Um, I tend to stick it in the prophecy section. But some of it, they weave into the poetry section. So it wasn't in the LXX. It wasn't dispersed in with, like, psalms. Wisdom wasn't with psalms. It was always at the end? Well, most of it was. Okay. But there was a, a book called Ecclesiasticus. Yeah. Uh, that was stuck in there where, you know, Proverbs is, or Ecclesiastes. And then there's a book called Wisdom, and that was stuck in there. And there's stuff added to Esther that was stuck in there at, at Esther. So it wasn't exclusively at the end, uh, but it's pretty clearly distinguished. Yeah, but in the Catholic Bible, it's always at the end, right? No, no, no not always. Okay, yeah, you just have to, you kind of, again, you have to pay attention to the publication. You know, are you looking at the New English Bible? Are you look, you know, which is not Catholic? Are you looking at the New American Bible, which is Catholic? I mean, the different publishers are going to do slightly different things with that, and you have to pay attention to that. As Luke pointed out, all the apocryphal books are written um, after the Maccabean Revolt, so it's not like they're written at the same time as Isaiah or Jeremiah or any of those guys. And one of the best things you do is satisfy your curiosity, and I encourage people to do this. It's no different than... Um, the Gnostic texts, you know, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, and there's a whole plethora of books out there um, coming out in the basically the second, third centuries, you know, quite distinctly removed in time from um, the New Testament uh, scriptures. But you can read the Apocrypha, you can get a Catholic Bible, you can read it online, you can read these Gnostic texts, and it's obvious when you start reading any of this literature that is distinctly different from the Old Testament scripture or the New Testament scripture or anything in the word of God and um, nobody no Jewish scholars accepted the Apocrypha it wasn't they repudiated it, it was just sort of a esoteric literature of the time um, that sort of encouraged the people but it was never understood or recognized um, as being inspired from God. And nobody quoted it. Jesus didn't quote it. The apostles didn't quote it. The early church didn't recognize it, nor did the Jewish society recognize it as inspired, not just a matter of record. But people need to read this stuff for themselves rather than just guessing. Yeah. See, you, you know, okay. So when somebody tries to fake scripture, okay, take the Book of Mormon, for example. Okay, somebody trying to fake scripture, right? Well, you start reading this stuff. <laughs> oh, really? And it came to pass, and it came to pass. You know, good, Joseph, come on. <laughs> you think you're caught in here, see? And, you know, when, when man tries to write like God, he can't do it. See, it, 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 it is pretty, again, now that'll come up, but that's one of the things that they use when they're trying to make sure that they had the right books for the New Testament, is they're looking, <coughs> you know, does it, does it have the, you know, the God ring to it? You know, does, I mean, you know, you, nobody writes like that. I, I saw some guy try to fake write a psalm one time, and, you know, he was pretty ignorant, so he stuck Selah in there every so often. <laughs> but see, that's the fakes. They always do something stupid in there that you can tell. And again, I, I encourage you, go back and read some of those Old Testament, or the Apocrypha, uh, right, you know, and, and, you know, you'll have a hard time getting through them. You know, you might do okay in First Maccabees or something like that. But, <clears throat> boy, you try to read Judith or, you know, about special, you know, I mean, Bell and the dra Dragon. You, you read some of those, you're going to say, okay, anybody thought that was really scripture? You know, I mean, it's a, and same way, you read the Epistle of Barnabas or the Gospel of Thomas, you're going to say, Really? Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code, you're trying to say this is scripture? See, it's instantly obvious that it isn't to anybody that can 
you know, again, it's like, you know, when you know what, what real stuff is, you can detect counterfeit pretty quick. And that's actually one of the tests that they used to try to determine which books were the authentic books of the New Testament writings. They could, you know, I mean, they had other things that they did too, but that was one of the tests. Does it sound like scripture? You know, and that's actually a good test. You know, if I had an old silver dollar, you know, Gresham's law says that bad currency drives good currency out of circulation. So how many silver dollars do you have? See, but as a kid, you know, they, the, the merchants at Ennis, they would not accept a paper $1 bill. They, uh, they accept paper fives and paper twenties, but they wouldn't accept a paper. See, because the mining community was committed to the fact that you're going to have specie, that is, <coughs> you know, real money, right? You know, paper, paper is not specie. Paper is not real money. That's why the old notes used to say, this is redeemable and lawful money. Gary's got quite a collection sometime of those. But you had a silver dollar. One of the tests, the silver dollar, you hit it with your thumb. Boing, see? And, sp and, and when that thing was spinning, what would it do? Ring. See, that's where the expression ring true comes from. See, because that was one of the tests that you did was to see <coughs> if this was real silver or not. Because, you know, if you have something that's getting a little bit of alloy, okay, take one of your quarters, for example, you know, which is basically zinc or something like that, you know, uh, with a little bit of copper maybe and, and, and a slight, slight, slight silver coating, okay? And you thump that, what does it do? Boom. There's no ring there at all. But see, a, a real silver will ring, Okay. So it's, that's a legitimate test. That's a legitimate test. How's the sound? Does it, does it ring true? That, that is actually a legitimate test to see. Because when you read the scripture, okay, I mean, who is, who is going to write Leviticus? All right? Speak to the sons of Aaron and say, you know, really? Okay, so we got, you know, and then it's got to be repeated, you know. Right? So do this, do this, and do this. Okay? And then, then the after gets done with that. So Aaron then, you know, did that, right? Okay? But see, what's God doing there? He's establishing his authority. See, the slide presentation that I put together after I finished with this is what God used to establish the authority of the scriptures all the way along. And it's kind of interesting, you know, to, to chew on that. I, something I was thinking about based on these classes and so one Lord's Day evening in Butte, you know, I just put together this presentation real quick, and I said, hmm, that needs to be a slide. So, you know, but it's, it's, it's interesting how, how this all works. <coughs> the, the guys that trash the scripture, do they have legitimate reasons? Never. Okay, well, you got to discount the Bible. Why? It's crazy to think that it had all these animals on the ark. Well, how about a little investigation, you know? You just don't get to wave your hand and dismiss it, okay? I'm sure the Bible's actually a conspiracy theory right now. I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, that's the way we get rid of everything is it's a conspiracy theory, right? But, okay, you don't, legitimately, you don't just get to wave your hand. You know, sometimes when I do a wedding, you know, I'll ask the question, okay, what's the best explanation as to how mankind got here? God created them male and female you know and you don't just get to wave your hand and say oh well you know that's that's mythology I mean this Adam and Eve stuff okay <coughs> from an evolutionary perspective how do you get the development of male and female exactly the same time for all species okay you don't just get to wave that aside say oh well it happened <coughs> you know see the you know the honest mind is going to say okay yeah, I need to process that and it's exactly the same type of test that we're running on the scripture, okay? The honest mind's going to process and say, okay, <coughs> you know, is, are the apocrypha? Is there any legitimacy? Well, you can process that. <coughs> Personally, I'm interested in truth. And if the Book of Mormon was truth, that's where I'd be, okay? You know, personally, right now, I wouldn't like it, but, <laughs> you know, but I mean, if it was truth, you know, it, but it, would, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't add up, you know. <clears throat> At one point, Joseph Smith says, my soul likes Isaiah very much. 
And so he, you know, quotes about four chapters of the book of Isaiah, you know, just to fill, sp you know, I don't know if he's getting paid by the word, you know, but he's just filling space, okay? And on top of that, he's quoting Isaiah out of the King James Version. Okay, well, <coughs> the, the golden tablets were supposedly <coughs> written in Egyptian reform. So <coughs> if you're going to, quote Isaiah, you're going to be translating from the Egyptian reform, not copying the King James Version. See, so in 1830, did you speak King James English? No. I mean, we've read Alexander Campbell here, 1830. I mean, he uses bigger words than we do, but outside of that, you know, it's, it's, it's modern English, okay? So why... Why is there an attempt in the Book of Mormon to imitate King James English in 1830? See, it's, it, all this stuff is just bogus for anybody that asks the question. These are the tests that you're applying to the Apocrypha. These are the tests that you're applying to the Gnostic Gospels and stuff that came around 200 A.D. or whatever. And the point is that there have been con artists in every generation. There, there are guys who claim to have inside information that nobody else has got. You know, I was asked about, uh, I think Laura asked about John Hagee Ministries and, and in uh, another series of books. Uh, so, I, you know, I tried to do my due diligence and, you know, and uh, that other series of books, and I can't think of the name of it right, all, right off the top of my head. You know, it, oh, they've got secret information, you know. Did you know there's a lighthouse? Uh, on the eastern coast of Massachusetts that contains hidden secrets that help uh, help illustrate the Bible. You know, I mean, but people buy that stuff all the time. Okay. So, you know, I remember years ago I was listening to a Napoleon Hill tape. The, the title was called Acres of Diamonds. And, uh, I mean, this kind of you know, came back to mind because, you know, I, I just finished reading the roadside geology of Montana, and diamonds have been found in Montana. You know, there's a lady, you know, and she and her friend were walking outside of Helena, and, and she saw a diamond in, in a gravel pit. <coughs> you know, she somehow recognized it, picked a nice one, you know. And, you know, I don't know how many carrots it was after they cut it. Now, but who knows where that gravel came from? <laughs> How do you track that diamond down? Okay. Anyhow, Napoleon Hill talks about this guy who's going all over the world trying to find diamonds, okay? And uh, when he died, you know, they came to, you know, they came to his place. They found out that his place in Arkansas w was right on, you know, one of the old volcanic craters, and there was actually acres of diamonds in his backyard. You know, and see, it isn't, the, it isn't interesting. The human race is always interested in the wild and the wonderful and the weird, you know, instead of the acres of diamonds, the stuff, the solid stuff that's right there at your fingertips. See, but, the, but the con artists have always played on that, always used those as manipulation techniques and, and, and work. See, so, you know, that's why we just stick with the solid stuff. So, so any other th thoughts here in closing? But I did want to go back and, and do those 53 books, you know, because it did come up last week. And, and I was actually surprised to see it up there. I'd kind of gone through the slide presentation, but I went through it. I said, wait a minute, 53 books. I've got to go back and make sure I give a good answer on that one. So.